Well, welcome. Welcome to Leading Australian Churches in a Changing Culture. You know, we've all come from different days, different places um, in our city, even across a few people from interstate. So as we come together, tonight we acknowledge God's sovereignty over these lands now called Australia. We pause, uh, we praise the creator of all things, affirming God's call for us to be faithful stewards of his, this good creation. We are thankful for the peoples of the Wajuk Noongar Nation, for their deep ongoing connection and care of this land upon which we meet. We honour their elders past, present and emerging, and tonight, as a faithful community, we join with the restoring, reconciling and healing work of the Holy Spirit amongst all peoples of Australia. To help us in this quest to see renewal and revival in Western Australia, the West Australian churches, we've invited Mark and Trudy Sayers to share something of their journey understanding and passion to see this happen in our great nation. Mark is married to Trudy. They have three teenage children. Um, Mark leads the ministry team at Red Church in Melbourne. He's an author of numerous books. My favourite is Non-Anxious Presence. Um, he's also a key speaker of the Rebuilders podcast series. Trudy is Mark's wife and joins him on the team at Red Church. She is also the Australian Director of 24-7 Prayer Movement. They both speak nationally and internationally. Mark and Trudy, thank you for coming to encourage and inspire us towards renewal in our churches. You know, as I uh, began to think about tonight, in Chronicles there's a story of where Thousands of men joined David's army in trying to put him in as a king. And it goes through all the tribes talking about so many thousands from this tribe, so many thousands from this tribe joined David in trying to bring him to king. But then right in the middle, uh, many of you would have known, there's this little verse that says, Then there was a men of Issachar, 200. But the key thing about them was, it says, all these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. See, I believe Mark and Trudy are a couple leading the way in helping us understand our times and know what we must do. Please welcome Mark and Trudy. We did have a microphone earlier, but I think we've lost it. Uh, yeah, as, I'm Mark, and uh, this is Trudy. Uh, I brought Trudy up because Trudy's going to share in the second part. Um, I'm going to start by sharing first, um, but I thought you should say hello, Trudy, so I'll let you introduce yourself. You've been introduced, but you can just say hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming out on a Monday night uh, to hear what, what God has put on our heart, and just um, we just... Already uh, love your city, I uh, love your, well, I haven't seen all of your state, but um, just really praying that God will uh, give us a heart for, for what he's doing in your city as we speak as well, and we've just tried to walk around and pray and, and sense what the Lord wants to say. So yeah, we're excited for what God wants to do. And give Trudy a round of applause, because this is her first time in Western Australia. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's uh, great to be here, and how we're going to break this up is uh, I'm going to begin to really talk into, I guess, our moment and our cultural opportunity that is before us. And then in the second part, we'll have a break in the middle, but in the second part, Trudy's really going to talk about the place of prayer in that. Uh, I, for many years, spoke about culture, and um, I found a strange journey occur as I began to speak about culture. When I first would do uh, talks on culture, I'd get invited to different conferences and you would be put in the furthest away 
tent or breakout room that you possibly could. I do remember speaking in one where literally they took me out there, they left me there. Uh, I think there was like two people came to listen to me. One was the tech person. And then halfway through, like, there was this massive downpour and this sort of water started heading towards like the speakers. There was no one there to look after it. And uh, yeah, I thought we were going to have a, you know, some sort of fire or outage. But what I've noticed is slowly the journey's gotten closer to the center of the conversation. Uh, it was really interesting, uh, a few years ago now, 2016, uh, my friend John Markoma and I did a podcast, which we just thought would be for our churches, just talking about some of these cultural things, because we thought we were in cities like Melbourne and Portland, where only people were interested in some of the cultural pressures that were coming against the church. And we just did it for ourselves, and that thing just took off and went crazy around the world, and still, people still sort of listen to it and refer to it. And what I found is that the issue of the church in the culture is now absolutely central. No longer is it a breakout session. For many people, it seems to be the central thing. And when we talk about culture, I think there's some ideas that we have around the pressure that the church feels itself in an ever-changing cultural landscape. I think one of the reasons that people are much more interested now is because they feel a sense of pressure And that the landscape has changed and they struggle to identify some of the landscape and wonder what is the way forward as the church. And so when I ask people what are the things that they want to talk about when they understand culture, almost inevitably it'll be around a battle of ideas. Ideas that have come into the culture that seem sometimes opposed to the church. People want to talk about different culture war issues. But what I've discovered I think in the last few years is that actually I think often when we talk about culture, there's things which have a more powerful influence on our culture than just simply ideas. And to do this, I'd like to begin with the Scriptures, and I'd like to begin in a really unexpected place. We're going to begin in the book of Job, and uh, in the past, you used to be able to say, if you brought your Bibles tonight, and some people wouldn't have... um, uh, my dad grew up as a Baptist in the 60s. Everyone bought their Bibles back then. Uh, but today, everyone has their Bible because you've all got phones. So you've either got Google or you've got a Bible app. But what I'm going to get you to do is I'm actually going to get you to turn to Job, the book of Job 28. And I'm going to get you to read with the person next to you, Job 28, verses 1 to 12. Job 28, verses 1 to 12. And then we're gonna, I'm going to speak about it a little bit. So you're going to have to uh, read this, read to the person next to you. Everyone's going to be talking at once, it's okay. Uh, and we're all going to do a bunch of Bible reading together. And like that, everyone went quiet. This is a, a fascinating passage, and it's probably a bit unexpected. Firstly, what it's talking about is something that was happening in the Bronze Age, which was mining. You have here this metaphor of mining and this imagery of people digging deep into the earth. Now, what you need to remember at the time, the Hebrew imagination, the biblical imagination, understands the world in a very different way. The skies is almost something which is keeping the heavens, uh, it's like a separating membrane, keeping the heavens separate from the earth. There were these waters which were in the, in the sky and the waters would sometimes come down onto the land and we have the story of the flood where the world is filled with water. The earth is actually seen very differently than as we see it today. The earth is this place which is dark. When you dig deep into it, there's a sense of fear and there's a sense that actually there's, there's trepidation under the sea, under the water, there's chaos deep in the earth. But it talks about what some people are prepared to do, that some people are prepared to even go to the lengths of digging deep into the earth and take these elements out. We have silver mentioned here, gold, iron, copper. We have smelting. We have ore. And you have this image of humans putting themselves in danger, mortals. It uses that term mortals referencing our mortality, going deep into the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses for awe in the blackest darkness. 
Far from human dwellings, they cut a shaft in places untouched by human feet. Far from other people, they dangle and sway. Incredible images. You're not used to this in the Scriptures of people digging deep into the earth, perhaps on, on, on ropes, really primitive mining techniques uh, compared to you know, what happens today in the mining industry with all its technology. And here it says, the earth from which, the f- which food comes... So this sense of what most people would have been connected with the earth by, this thing where everyone would have been connected to some sort of form of, uh, you know, very close to the food that's produced to agriculture. But this is different. And these different uh, uh, jewels, lapis lazuli, dust, gold nuggets, all of these things, no bird of prey. The birds have this ability to see at a big distance, but in the earth, it's, everything is shrunken down. Why are people doing this? People are assaulting the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all of its treasure. They search for the sources of rivers and bring hidden things to light. Culture is driven by energy. Culture is driven by energy. And what you see here is actually the beginnings of a process where people begin to look for things to sell, to find sources of energy, whether it's an economic energy you get from digging gold from the ground or things that could be then turned into energy sources, and very much culture is shaped by energy. And one of the things that people don't realize is that some of the elements of our culture now are totally sustained by our energy sources. Now, let me give you an example. Just really quickly, turn to the person next to you and tell them five things which you think are indicative of our culture at the moment. If you had to use five words to describe our culture and some of the challenges coming against the church at the moment, just just turn to the person next to you. There's going to be a little bit of speaking to the people next to you. you. Say hello to them if you haven't met them yet. You've just read the scriptures together. Um, but just give five things, just you know, really quickly, technological, you might say, or it might be relativistic, whatever. It doesn't have to be flash ones. It could be greedy, whatever it is. Five things, turn to the person next to you, describe our Australian culture at the moment. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to get you to do that again, but we're going to change things a little bit. What if the internet stopped? (laughs) Dom DeLillo wrote uh, wrote a novel about this. Obama has um, produced on Netflix this show. I think this how the world is. Leave the World Behind, I think it's called. Um, and it's really quite interesting. Like he's, it's, it's a, in, the, in, the, in the movie, it's like, what if basically there's a large-scale hacking of the infrastructure network and there's like this scene where like Teslas are just driving themselves on the freeway and crashing each other. Um, I saw an interview uh, this week um, with Dominic Cummings, who was uh, the chief of staff for Boris Johnson during his, uh, his uh, pres- prime ministership. And he just talked about a meeting they had where uh, MI6 or whatever came in and said to Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak, um, who was his sort of second in command at that time, now Prime Minister. And basically, uh, the British intelligence services then said, as part of their briefing, this is what foreign governments are able to do to our power grid infrastructure and stuff. And Dominic Cummings said, I cannot tell you what, because it's classified. But I will say that Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak's jaws were on the ground. And if you could imagine the most shocking thriller, it's more extreme than that. So there is a possibility. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but let's just play out the hypothetical now. The internet is knocked down. Western Australia has significant amounts of time with no electricity. Uh, Western Australia is cut off from large parts of the rest of Australia. Supply chains begin to fall over. That goes on for, say, six months a year. Uh, Turn to the person next to you. What would Western Australia's culture look like at that time? Turn, discuss, how would things change if that happened? (laughs) All right. You seem to be enjoying this. You seem to be enjoying this. It was an excited uh, crest of, of, of conversation that started at the beginning of that discussion. See, so much of actually 
culture is based on our ability to provide a certain kind of life. And particularly in Australia and a lot of the developed world, we've lived in one of the most unique times in human history, particularly from around 1990 onwards. In 1990, the Cold War effectively ends when the Berlin Wall falls and the world entered into this really unusual period. There was almost a sort of uh, mania that took over. People felt, actually, if you, you go back and you read books, Francis, Francis Fukuyama famously said that history had ended. And what he meant by that is if history was a struggle, we'd now reach the end of history. And the end of history was this very peaceful world where we solved all of the world's problems. And the world would slowly just move to this very progressive, democratic utopia. Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Fed at the time, actually began to speak of a era in the economic history of the world where we'd no longer have recessions of just endless economic growth. At this time, it was just before the dot-com bubble, and you saw this fusion of Wall Street and what was happening on Silicon Valley. The two coasts of America came together with a new powerful force where the internet arrived. And some of the promises around the internet at the beginning were quite incredible. I've still got books somewhere in a box from around 19, you know, early 1990s. And they were promising that what the internet would do would actually it would connect us. There's a, a couple of writers, I think it's Barry and Wellman, their, their last names, and they talked about what would happen in the future is that people have become disconnected in modern society, and the solution to this will be digital devices. And digital devices will bring in a new form of individualism that's called networked individualism. And networked individualism will not be like the old individualism. You'll be able to do what you want to do, but still feel totally connected to others and the internet will bring us closer to the people you really love. There was also a promise that what the internet would do, would, that it would bring down almost all authoritarian governments. No longer would propaganda or disinformation reign. Truth would rise to the surface, and the people without much power would be able to bring down the powerful. And so there was this sense that this is the world we were moving into. If you are under 40, this is very much the world which shaped you. That there was this sense that you could move towards a kind of life which would be unlike anything other people had seen before. And for a while, some of this stuff did happen. We did turn our eyes away from some of the trouble spots in the world. But the world did believe that for a sense that this life could continue. There were hiccups, 9-11, the global financial crisis, but things began to change. There were workarounds. One of the things that changed was the traditional biblical injunction against debt was wiped away. And all of a sudden, this sense where we could have credit cards and borrow money to get everything we want, almost in a sense, pushed that idea of delaying gratification out of the ballpark and we could just have what we wanted. And it wasn't just ordinary people that were putting things on, on credit cards. It was governments. It was big businesses. All of a sudden, after 2008, we just started printing money. And it just seemed like the world was this place. And, and we just kept buying houses and pumping money into everything. And everything just seemingly kept getting better. But then by 2016, there starts to be this slow realization that, hang on, this is not going the direction we thought. The internet is not what we expected. In Egypt, there was a thing called the Egyptian Uprising, which was part of the Arab Spring. Uh, Wael Ghanim was a Google engineer in Dubai, started a Facebook group, and this Facebook group then turned into protests in Tahrir Square, which brought down the government of Hosni Mubarak. And this was this moment where this is the internet bringing down the authoritarians. But where the story goes is what actually ends up happening is Mubarak is brought down, but then the, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan, come to power, and then they're removed in another coup and a new dictator, Sisi, comes in, and Sisi uses the internet to actually repress and uses the technologies of the internet to actually repress people. And people start to go, hang on, the world that we thought was going to be born is not being born. And what we start to see, particularly since the shocks of COVID, when we had the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression, but it didn't feel like it because governments printed money and they, they needed to at the beginning. But the problem was actually we've been printing money since 2008 and all of a sudden 
we start to see the return of something that we thought had gone away, inflation. And inflation tends to be sticky and difficult to get rid of. And all of a sudden, when inflation comes, then what you have is something else, which is called a cost of living crisis. And then the unthinkable happens. You have a war in Europe, and Europe was supposed to not have wars anymore when Russia invades Ukraine. And this creates a whole host of problems in the world. The world was like this super well-functioning machine. It's like a car. If you've got a new car and it's absolutely brilliant until there's like one little problem with software or one little fuse somewhere that goes wrong and everything begins to go wrong. It's not like the old cars where you can just take it down the mechanic, you find something at the back shed and fix it and you're on your way. Brilliant until something goes wrong. And then this slow-growing sense that there's something amiss with our world. All of a sudden, young people thinking that they're going to not have as good lives as their parents. The sense in Australia that actually what we thought was that probably the most affluent time in human history and some of the most privileged that people have ever had in history in Australia, the, in, you know, the things in 2016, Credit Suisse said Australians are the richest people in the world when you put all the factors together. And you may live in a state, which may be one of the richest states in this country because you've been digging in the ground. But again, too, all these factors were predicated on things like decisions that are made in Beijing affect what happens in this state. And so this world was this deeply interconnected network of all these places, being, things being in the right place at the right time, but there's a growing sense that they're starting to disconnect. And so you have COVID, you have the war in Ukraine, you start to have political reactions that people are not expecting. What the expect, experts thought was happening is not happening. And then what you start to have is this break. And so we're at this really interesting inflection point in the world. So the talks I would have given if this was 2017 is I would have talked about ideology, I would have talked about polarization, I would have talked about many of these things, but I actually think things are moving very rapidly and these are probably not going to be the things we're talking about in a few years. There is a religious sociologist called Ronald Engelhardt and he talks about, he plots countries in the world on these plots of how much money they have, like how much security they have, and how exposed they are to violence and danger. And what you find is that the kind of questions that societies ask change when you move them around on the quadrants. When people are sitting there going, I don't know what to do with my money. I don't know where I'm going to go tonight, what movie I'm going to see, what restaurant I'm going to. They ask very different spiritually questions than people who don't know where their next meal's coming from or what the next government looks like. Now, we're not there. We've probably come from way up here down to here. But that short little drop is changing things. Trinity's going to talk about 24-7 prayer, but really interesting 24-7 prayer. When, when the, we've forgotten a lot of this now. But in the first seven weeks of the pandemic, people did not know what the death toll was going to be. There were some reports that it was going to be 7% of people who were infected with COVID would die. Now, it didn't end up being anywhere near that. But there was a real sense at the beginning of the pandemic when you turned on your TV and you saw Rome, London, Paris, Beijing, Tokyo, completely empty. And there were these reports that like, like, like 7%. I remember seeing that going, what, what if I have to bury 7% of my church? Like, what, what are we going to do here? Is this going to be like the, you know, the Spanish flu at the end of, of World War I? During that period, the amount of people who started praying around the world was phenomenal. I had a friend in, in Denmark, uh, he's a pastor there, vineyard pastor, and they saw in Denmark, like this is super secular Denmark, tiny church, a massive uptick in people seeking prayer. Do you know after 9-11, Australian churches saw for a few weeks a kick up in people attending church. This was something that was on the other side of the world that didn't really affect Australia, but it popped the bubble that we have about ourselves. And this reveals something really, really interesting. Secularism is supported by a bunch of structures which make you think that you can live a life without God. And we in Australia have taken many of these things for granted. But all of a sudden, when these things start to be shifted, 
And all of a sudden, things don't look like the world doesn't look rosy anymore, and you don't know what the future looks like, things start to spiritually change. So, what I want to say is, I'm not going to be able to predict the future, but I really don't think we're going back to 2015 anytime soon. There was a fascinating bunch of research done in New Zealand. Um, the Nationals won the last election against Jacinta, uh, Jacinda Ardern's um, Labor Party. And the Nationals did this research, and they said that there's a new type of conservative, and they pitched this new type of conservative. Now, often conservatives want to go back to 1956 or something. They said the new New Zealand conservative wants to go back to 2015. And they just want to go back to, like, like just a few years ago when it was good. I don't think we're going back to 2015. I think there's a number of things that are coming in the future that are inevitable that are going to mean that things change. Energy in the world is one of them. And there are so many interesting things in this world that are about to change. We are an axial point. We're moving from a world of globalization to a much more block world. This is going to have implications. It's probably going to have implications for this state. I could pitch that. I could do an hour lecture now on, on what does the future hold. Um, I'm tempted, but I won't. But I do want to say this, and this is what I want to put our attention to. Something has happened in the last two years as people's faith in the world has been rocked. Peter Berger talked about plausibility structures, and he wrote a number of books. Peter Berger, fam- probably the most famous religious sociologist, and he, he talked about how to, he's talk, really talked about how do people in religious communities ensure that the people who are part of them sustain their belief. He talked about Orthodox Jews in New York. How do they sustain this belief in these very strict Hasidic communities in the midst of you know, the world's capital, really, New York City, with all Times Square's lights flashing at them? And one of the things is, The more that a religious community, the plausibility is that if the things that it says will make a better life actually give you a better life, that means that people tend to stay in that religious community. And it's so interesting because for years I read that stuff and and had friends, we talked about it often and how do you, you know, have plausibility structures, you know, people talk about things like trends like deconstruction and people like deconstructing their faith, so how do we have good plausibility structures? I had friends who set up ministry to, to help, you know, young people be resilient in their faith and so on. That's important stuff. But it just began to dawn on me about 12 months ago that actually what the, 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 the paradigm that I've been thinking about, how do you keep people uh, solid in their faith, that actually was now happening to secularism, that the plausibility of secularism was actually beginning to rupture, that the promises it had told young people of what to do to get a good life were no longer working. If you're at a point where something like 86% of young Australians have a mental health condition, when in other cultures there's normally a, a particular percentage that if you look at every culture from Tongans to, to Japanese, there is certain percentages that different psychological uh, conditions have. But if we've so jumped above that, there has to be something that's going on culturally. And increasingly people are seeing this. So actually what is happening at this moment is that people are having a massive doubt and belief crisis about the promises of secularism. And that's happening in Australia. But you'll miss it if you think it's going to be discussed on the project on Channel 10. (laughs) You'll miss it if you think it's going to be discussed in the newspaper. But you may hear it if you sit long enough with the guy at the pub. Or maybe everyone goes home and he's had a couple drinks and he starts telling you what he really thinks. If you sit down with a friend and listen long enough, if you listen and maybe if you went through people's Google searches and asked what they're thinking about psychics and UFOs and spiritual things, like, like often these are things which people laugh at, but just look at the fact. I mean, you've had people with so many things that they're told in the world that they're meant to believe and they feel ripped off now. You've literally got the US Congress having meetings on do UFOs exist. Like that's, that's not normal, Okay. And people see that stuff, and they've lost so much trust in the mainstream news. Now, there's a whole conversation on mainstream news and how do we have disinformation and culture. And that's a really important thing. We need to have good information. I'm in support of that. Like, good information is really important. The truth's really important. But what we can miss as the church is there is a whole bunch of repressed seeking going on in Australia. 
And I think churches, when we're just in a 2016 mindset of like, there's a culture war, there's polarization. Wow, people are going to get angry at me if I say this or say that. What we're going to miss, and I'm not writing that off. I get that. I'm a pastor. I've had people yell at me over certain things, right? That's happened to me. I get that. But what I'm saying is, I think what we need to know now is where things are going, an increasing and I think surprising amount of Australians are going to start to ask spiritual questions. And I think that some of you have probably got some of those stories. I did a sermon on this a few weeks ago at church, and I was astounded of the people who just came up afterwards and said, I've been trying to share the gospel with my sister for 15 years, and in the last two years, she just asked me, about questions, and then the other week she asked for a Bible. I had someone come up and say the two people who are the most unlikely people who she thought would ask about faith have actually become Christians. I'm talking to people who are having like weird conversations with people who are like witches and into pagan stuff who are making commitments and becoming Christians, just utterly bonkers stuff that we're not expecting to happen, maybe because we bought too much of Australia's poison that Australia is a secular place and people aren't interested. And I actually think, scratch on the surface, every time there's a bushfire, there'll always be a report of someone. Like, this happens every time. I don't know if it happens here, but in Victoria, always, I've seen it so many times when there's like a bad bushfire. There'll be someone, you know, like, how'd you get out, mate? Oh, you know, the fire came across, it came up the road, and, mate, I thought we were gone. And they often say this line, mate, I'm not religious, but... <laughs> I'm not religious, but something happened back there, and I, pfft, I don't know what it is. So I chucked a prayer up. Like... There is this subversive spirituality in Australia that we need to scratch beneath the surface of and bring to the surface. And I think we're going to see more and more. I don't want bad stuff to happen. I don't want there to be more geopolitical conflict wars. I don't want there to be environmental disasters. I don't want any of this stuff to happen. Some of it's probably going to happen because we live in history and we live on planet Earth. And this is a sin-wrecked world and we just have to look at what happens in the world. But as some of these things happen, the last 30 years, which has acted as a kind of narcotic on us, where we think a perfected world is possible, that myth is starting to be destroyed, and we need to be ready. Just quickly, turn to the person next to you. Have you seen this? Where are you seeing this break happening in people? Where are you you sensing? Maybe this has given you language for something you're seeing or conversations you've had. Just have a quick touch point with the person next to you. So... I think we have before us an absolutely incredible opportunity. I think there is a moment, and I think at the time when so many people feel fearful about the future, we actually have an eternal God, and a God, a Jesus, who so many times in the gospel says, do not fear, do not be afraid. And I feel like we need to reframe our vision to actually see the opportunity in this moment. But we have some challenges. We need energy at this time. If the church is going to grab this moment, we need to look for our own energy source and dig deep into the earth. You see, after 1945, there actually was a growth in the Australian church. If you look at Great Britain, Canada, this happened, in New Zealand and Australia, there was this high point for the church. People had come back from the war. People wanted to settle down. People wanted to get and have children. This was in the baby boom happened. A lot of soldiers had been away from their wives and came. This stuff happens and there's lots of babies born. And this is when refrigerators became popular because people wanted to get around a refrigerator and have food there and have the sense of security. And so churches grew up all across Australia. These particular kinds of churches, if you look for them, they're churches, they normally fit about 80 to 150 people. They all seem to have an undersized basketball court. Like, what is with that? Um, And they really represented this new kind of life which came out from the cities as people settled down and put roots into the ground. This was also a time where there was a significant amount of connection into local communities. I've got a picture of near Box Hill, near where our church is, and just it's like this parade in Box Hill. It's so weird. And there's like, you know, the the Country Women's Association. This is the city. Why are they even there? You know, there's like Masonic Lodges and Boys Brigades and all these different groups. Everyone was out every second night doing something and going to church activities. It was a time of massively high volunteerism. Uh, This is when people did national service. 
This was a sense where there still was a concept of being a citizen rather than what we see today as a consumer. And that actually gave this tremendous energy to the church. And so many of our institutions, everything from university ministries to prison ministries to overseas ministries, church denominations, there was this huge release of energy. And then as that generation grew up, now lots of people bag out baby boomers, but they brought so much volunteerism to the church. Good on you, baby boomers. Thank you. My parents, ne- never in paid ministry. But in so many, they, they'd be on boards and they'd be handing out the bulletin at the front of church and still have that role in our church today uh, in their 70s. But soon, that generation will pass. And it was a big generation. And what we're seeing is we're not seeing that generation being replaced. And so soon, and I speak at churches across Australia, and you look at the room, and I've done the mental maths, and I look at the room and go, who are these people going to be here in 20 years? And that's going to be a massive challenge. That is a reduction of energy in just bums on seats energy, turning up energy, volunteer energy, giving energy, governance energy. That's going to disappear. We have also something where... Because of this 30-year reality where we move from a citizen mentality to a consumer mentality is that people aren't as present anymore. The church bought the myth as well that you can have it all with minimal investment. And so that volunteerism, that turning up-ism just isn't there. And regular attendance increasing the Australian church like, looks like coming every four to six weeks. And really what that is, is sociologists would call that a significant decline of social capital, often seen before civilizational declines. After the tsunamis in Japan and the destruction of Fukushima, sociologists found that one of the most important things was not just about getting food and water on the ground and housing, those things are important, but what enables communities to flourish after tragedy to be resilient is actually social capital. And so our lack of social capital is actually a kind of slow rolling natural disaster in of itself where increasingly young Australians are isolated, struggle with basic relationships. And this is not me bagging them out. This is the world that they were set up for. And then you bring into that social media, you have a significant decline of social capital. It's not just young people. That's happening to all generations. It's not just young people on their phones. And that's affected the church. Churches are increasingly incredibly fragile and liquid. People move very often. And then lastly, what happened was, as these things were happening, we tried to compensate by pushing into some of the values of the last 30 years where marketing and media increasingly replaced actually making stuff and being productive. Increasingly, government, instead of actually building a bridge, will just put out a press release about the bridge, do a nice video, say all the wonderful things we can do about the bridge, and then 50 years later, like, where was this bridge ever made? But we had a great video about the bridge. And really what this is, is platform. The myth that actually what we needed to do is be like the world and just market ourselves and have greater platform. And if we can get more followers and more people seeing us, that this is going to cut through in a culture. Chris Rojak said that, fascinating, sociologist talks about, talks about celebrity. And he said in one of his books about celebrity, he said, celebrity is a way that the religious remains in a secular environment. Like people will go on pilgrimages to see Taylor Swift. Like, I've got a bit of a t-shirt. You know, here she signed this. It's like, you know, Catholic icons in, you know, cathedrals. People scream, go ecstatic. These are all sort of religious things. So he says, uh, celebrity is how the religious stays in a secular society. And I thought about that. And I thought, you know what we've done in the last 10 years in many places We've brought celebrity into the church and we've brought then secular values into the religious. And so, the energy that we need to meet this opportunity, coming from volunteerism, from our ability to build social capital, our ability to actually have a message that cuts through in a time when people are listening to us. You know, something interesting, we can, 
there's an interesting book that's come out of the U.S. called Dechurching, and it's just talked about the amount of people who have not come back to church uh, since the pandemic in America. You can read this, and I've, got, I've had Aussie pastors like, oh, this is a huge thing. What are we going to do about it? Weirdly, there's some research done recently. I think it was McCrindle did this, and they actually found that Australians' trust in institutions has plummeted. It's gone up in the church. I'm trying to work this out. I think part of it is like, mate, everything else is stuffed. We're going to give you blokes a go. That's literally, I don't think it's that we're that amazing. I think that's sort of where it's at. So we have this opportunity and there's this moment where not everyone, but a percentage of the Australian population is going to look at us. But the usual things that we've looked for, energy, are not working. Volunteerism, bums on seats. How many people are going to turn to the committee meeting? We need something else. Let's turn back to Job 28. In verse 12, after where I got you to read to, it says, But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? I'm going to jump to 23. God understands the way to it, and He alone knows where it dwells. For He views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When He established the force of the wind and measured out of the waters, when He made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, when He looked at wisdom and appraised it, He confirmed it to the human. He, sorry, He confirmed it and tested it and said to the human race, "The fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding." We're about to go through an energy transition to renewables. That's going to happen in the world. People are going to start to look for lithium instead of oil. That's all happening. That's why Elon Musk is liking Malay in Argentina's tweets, because he wants his lithium. Just a side note there, for anyone who's interested. <laughs> but you know what? I think we're at an energy transition point for the church. What we have based so much of what we've done for the last few decades on, on being more relevant or just relying on volunteerism is actually falling over. Because you know what's also happened in the last little while is people have moved into this last phase. Part of the reason that people have not liked life since 2016 is increasingly they're having energy extracted from them. That actually digital platforms are taking our attention and our devotion and getting us sitting in front of them endlessly and people are increasingly feel like they're being exploited and extracted and ripped off. And do you know that soon, bigger than oil is actually going to be data that's taken from you. Your smartphone of how you sleep, what you Google search, and this stuff is being sold on markets around the world. And so increasingly we are being shaped by things which are mining us for our attention and devotion that we're actually meant to give to things which will bring life. So we're at this moment where the church has come to the end of itself of exhaustion. There are people out there exhausted. The culture's myths is telling about itself are exhausted. We're at an energy renewal point. But what is absolutely brilliant, let me give you another word for an energy transition when it happens in the church, it's renewal. And renewal happens when the men and women of God come to the end of themselves and go, we can no longer do this through our programs, through our volunteerism, through how loud we play, how quietly we, 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 we play our music, whatever it is. Many people on stage, one person on stage. How many things we hand out in the community, how many ventures we start, then none of this is going to work without the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We're about to sell about Pentecost this week. The Pentecost story is a bunch of people, like misfits, Galileans, uneducated people, who literally their Messiah seemingly has just been beaten. But they know that he's been resurrected. And what does he say to them? When they meet him, he says, wait in, Ju in Jerusalem until power comes upon you. That is an energy transition moment. That is when these ordinary people, I mean, the disciples, they're just bumbling fools seemingly sometimes in the Gospels. And then you see them in the book of Acts, and they're like these incredible people. They are pneumatological men and women filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think the Australian church is not going to be prepared for this moment by doing the same old things, by being smarter, more relevant, more organized, more church growth techniques. Let me tell you this. I am getting emails from churches that I grew up looking up to 
who I thought had answers overseas. And they're like, we don't know what to do now. People are leaving. This is not working anymore. The cultural Christians in America are walking away. People are coming to the end of themselves, and that's utterly brilliant because when we come to the end of ourselves, we arrive at what God can do that we can't do. So actually, the way forward is what it's always been for the people of God. It's actually really basic stuff, but it actually begins with us falling on our knees and saying, we cannot do it. Now, I just want to just tell you one thing. I'm going to finish in a second, and Trudy's going to get up and talk about how we access that power through prayer. In Australia, a myth will come, and it, you know, I, I, like I've got all over the world and go to places, and they're like, what's, our, what's the sort of stronghold? And I talk into different strongholds in different places. I'm just going to say this real quickly. Ours is comfort, and it's lifestyle, and possibly even more so in your state. Like, Victoria's had its butt kicked. Like, seriously. Like, people, there's a lot of people in Victoria who got smashed in the last season, and I'm seeing openness. And I wouldn't want to go through the last little bit again, uh, what we went through, but you saw an openness. We, you will have, at this moment, almost like a lulling narcotic sleep, the temptation, not to rebel, not to do anything crazy, but just to move into the comfort zone and slip into ennui, as the French call it, anomie, acedia. But I believe what God is doing is gathering the men and women who at this moment say, yeah, I'm at the end of myself, and I don't want to, I don't want to live for a mediocre church in this country any longer. Like, are we just going to continue to be seen as, as just, yeah, a bunch of nice people, we do a bit of community here and there, but while the sun is going down, at the moment of incredible opportunity, I actually think God wants to do it this time, something at this time, and He's calling us to wake up. And we don't have to do it in our strength. We just have to turn to His strength. So I'm going to pray. I think we're going to have a little uh, time to chat for about 20 minutes. Is that right? There's tea and coffee out there. Um, I encourage you to talk about this. There'll be like all the stuff that happens. Hey, hey, you going? I haven't seen you for a while. How's life? Do that. But also talk about this stuff. What's God speaking to you at this moment? Let me pray. Lord, show us the opportunity in the world. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God, you have made us for this moment. Every person in this room was born at this time to contribute at this time. We think about this moment a few days out from Pentecost. We imagine what the disciples must have been doing at this time, meeting at the temple, talking of meeting the resurrected Jesus, waiting in anticipation for power to come. God, we need your power. We come from different church expressions here, but what unites us all is we all need your power. God, I pray, Father, that you actually do a transformative thing amongst us. Help us to be alive to the opportunity in this moment, to be your light in the world. Wake us up, we pray. In your name. Amen.